Happy Advent. Thank you. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. And yet when we use something or someone contrary to their purpose, we will always, as a rule, end up dissatisfied, miserable, and oftentimes hurt or very possibly destroyed or worse. Everything has a purpose. This past week I was at the rectory and I noticed that one of the electrical socket covers was crooked. So I went to go and straighten it, but I realized that the screw that was holding the electrical socket plate to the wall was too tight, and I couldn't get the uh, cover to, to shift. Now, if you need to loosen a screw, what should you use? Yeah. So I decided to use my finger because that I thought would just, you know, just very simply just turn the screw and make it happen. I broke my fingernail. Is the purpose of my finger to undo screws? No. So what happened? I ended up dissatisfied, miserable, and actually hurt. I then was like, well, my toolbox is in the basement. I ran to the kitchen, and I pulled a knife out of the drawer, I put it on the screw, and the screw won, and the knife lost, and now my knife is bent. What is the purpose of a knife? It has a purpose, to cut things, not to be a screwdriver. So eventually I went down to the basement, got my screwdriver, brought it up, and lo and behold, it worked. Everything in life has a purpose. When we use something contrary to its purpose, we often end up dissatisfied, miserable, hurt, or even worse. Last week, and I asked the question, what is the purpose of Christmas? I put forth the idea that the purpose of Christmas is celebration, salvation, reconciliation. We apply it to Christmas trees and food and other things. And I've encouraged you to do the same throughout the entire month, one-twelfth of the year, that we celebrate Christmas. This morning I want to ask another question about purpose. What is your purpose? Why do you exist? Why do we exist? What's our purpose? Why are we here? What's it all about? Now, for those of you who are old and memorize the Baltimore Catechism, we know that we can have a very simple answer to this. If I ask the question of why do you exist, why did God make you, you can say, God made me to know him and love him and serve him. So we're going to reflect a little bit upon that, but in a totally different way. What is your purpose? Why are you here? And I want to look very clearly at Scripture. What is the first commandment given to humanity? If we go to the book of Genesis, God creates man and woman. They're in the garden. And what is God's first commandment to them? Genesis 1, chapter 28. Go forth and multiply. The first commandment to Adam and Eve is to have babies and to bring forth life. That's God's first commandment, is to be people of life, to bring forth life. Have babies. Do it. Then, sin enters into the world. God actually destroys the world through a flood, saves only eight human beings and all the animals in twosie woozies. And then what is, when, when the water goes down and the, the ark lands, 
actually in Kentucky, imagine that. When the, the ark lands, it's true. When the ark lands and the eight people get out of the, of the ark, what is God's first commandment to them? Go forth and multiply. Again and again, God commands that the purpose of life is to have more life. That we don't hoard life, but that we give life. Throughout the entire Old Testament, again and again and again and again and again, the union of man and woman bringing forth life is to change the world. And it does. This past Friday was the first Friday, so we had 12 hours of grace, 12 hours of confession at the St. Martin campus. We heard 160 confessions. It's a new record for our parish. It was awesome. Talk to any priest who hears confessions, or talk to any psychologist, and they will tell you that when the purpose given to man and woman is distorted and not used for its proper purpose, People, remain, people end up very dissatisfied, miserable, and very, very, very hurt and scarred. The biggest wounds that people carry with themselves often pertain to human sexuality gone wrong. When God's plan for love and marriage is distorted, the guilt, the shame, and the hurt is often unbearable. People come into the confessional. Bless you, Father, for I have sinned, take the Lord's name in vain like 20 times. I've missed about six or seven masses since my last confession. Uh, I've lied a whole bunch. Uh, been disobedient, stole a few things from the workplace. And then, uh, Father, I just oh, I feel so terrible about this. And then they confess one sexual sin. Like blaspheming God's name, disobeying his commandment to honor him every single Sunday means nothing. So why is it that the hurt and the pain that surrounds sexual sins is so huge? Because every sexual sin is God's gift of life being used for the wrong purpose. And whenever anything is used for the wrong purpose, we end up dissatisfied, miserable, and hurt. God said to humanity, go forth and multiply. And he gave a plan for this to happen. And it's a beautiful thing. It really is. Look at the other end of the spectrum. People who can't conceive a child. It's a horrible burden. There's pain and there's heartache and it, it, beyond imagining. Very clearly, one of the purposes of what it is to be a human person, what it is to be alive, is to bring forth life. So now let's go to Christianity. So there's Judaism. Christianity takes everything to a whole other level. It, it, it's, it doesn't void the Old Testament. It's still true that, we're supposed to, that the purpose of human life is to bring forth life. We're still supposed to do that. Any sin contrary to that is a sin. Any act contrary to that is a sin. So what does Christianity say? Well, once Jesus Christ dies and rises from the grave and now creates the church, so just as Adam and Eve were created their first commandment, what's the first commandment given to Adam and Eve? Go forth and multiply. What's the first commandment given to the church? Once the church is established, go therefore and baptize all nations. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What is the great command? What is the great commission given to the newly born church? Go forth and multiply. So what is our purpose? Old Testament and new to bring forth life. That is why God made us. God has created us to bring forth life. And I will tell you, if we're not doing that, we're going to end up miserable, dissatisfied, and hurt. At the center of what it is to be a Christian is to be a purpose, a, 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 is to be a person who has a purpose, and that purpose is to change the world. Naturally 
and supernaturally. That's why we exist. That's why we're here. The Bible is very clear about it. So let's look at today's gospel passage. John the Baptist, who, by the way, is right there, there is no one in Scripture that we know as much about as John the Baptist. You know it. You don't even have your Bibles open. I'm going to ask you five questions about John the Baptist, and you're going to know more about John the Baptist than, like, it really is mind-boggling. We dress Mary up in blue all the time. Turns out the Bible doesn't tell us what Mary wore. We have no idea what Mary ate. So watch this. You know all the answers. Where did John the Baptist live? In the desert. You know where he lived, right? Particularly in the desert, what, what did he live by? He lived by what river? You know specifically where he was. What did John the Baptist wear? Camel's hair and what? A leather belt. What did he eat? Locusts and wild honey. What did he say? Repent. What did he do? He baptized, as the gospel says, all of Judea, all of Jerusalem, and the surrounding area. Why do we know all of these things about John the Baptist? We even know how he died. He died defending marriage as he accused King Herod of committing the sin of adultery. Why do we know all of this stuff about John the, Baptist? John the Baptist? Because every single one of those things about John the Baptist points to his purpose. What was the purpose of John the Baptist? To proclaim repentance, to prepare the way of the Lord, and that was it. And he did it, and he did it in everything. Why was he in the desert? Because deserts are places where you go out and meet God, read the Bible. People, you, you meet God in the desert. That's why he was there in the desert. Why was he wearing camel's hair and a leather belt? Because those are clothes of repentance. Why was he eating locusts and wild honey? Well, honey, because he's a very smart man. I mean, let's be honest about it. Because that was the food of, of the poor. He chose to live a life of penance. He chose to live a life set aside from the rest of the world. He preached repentance, he baptized people. His whole purpose was to bring forth life and to prepare people to meet the Lord Jesus. He had a purpose and he lived it. John the Baptist, as he's in the desert, wearing camel's hair and a leather belt, eating locusts and wild honey, the Pharisees and the Sadducees show up and John the Baptist literally engages them in battle. He's like, you're a brood of vipers. There's an ax at the tree and that tree's going to be taken down and burnt in fire. John the Baptist, he's like a thug. He's like ready to take it on. He's, he's literally yelling and screaming at the scribes and the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees. What is his criticism? The, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they're like the religious leaders of the time. This is like taunting the Pope and the Cardinals. What did the Pharisees and the Sadducees not understand? Did they live a religious life? Yes! Yes, they did! What's the problem, though? They lived a religious life for the sake of religion. They lived a religious life for the sake of religion. Instead of living a religious life for the sake of conversion and life and charity and mercy and joy. You see, my brothers and sisters, we, as well, will end up in hell, where there's unquenchable fire, as John the Baptist says. If we live a religious life without charity and life and mercy and forgiveness and joy. It is quintessential for us to be like John the Baptist, who was very clear in what his purpose and his mission was. His purpose was to bring forth life in the world. And my brothers and sisters, it's no different for you and I. We will be dissatisfied 
miserable and hurt in our life if we don't do so. We will. Because God has a purpose for you, and that purpose is for you to bring forth life, for you to change the world, for you to go out and to help people get to heaven. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again and again and again. I am very thankful for all of you who have had children. Genuinely thankful. Thank you for saying yes to life. And I thank you also for having your children baptized. Whether they accept that baptism or live that baptism on their own, that's their choice. But thank you for having children. Thank you for having them baptized. That's what you're supposed to do. But I will tell you, the problem in our church right now is that 95% of the people who are baptized are infants. Because we bring our children to the baptismal font, but we're not bringing our neighbors and our cousins, our coworkers, our bosses, and our enemies to the waters of eternal life. Because we're not bearing fruit as God calls us. Because too many of us are religious but we're not fulfilling our purpose of bringing Christ into the world. And because of it, I truly believe that many people are miserable and dissatisfied, particularly in their faith, and question, why do I even do this? Because we've forgotten about the great call that we have to bring forth life, to change the world, and to invite people all the more into a relationship with the Lord. God is inviting every single one of you to use your own unique and specific talents, gifts, and abilities to change the world. He really is. I ask you during these Advent days to ask the question, God, why am I here? You're going to hear him say, for life. You're here to bring forth life. And then we need to answer that call individually. God, who am I supposed to be talking to? He'll tell you. God, how am I supposed to serve? He'll show you. Lord, where am I going to go? He'll open the door. We exist for life, natural and spiritual. It's the purpose of humanity. St. John Paul II said this, place your talents and your enthusiasm at the service of life. Place your talents and your enthusiasm at the service of life, natural and supernatural. Let's pray for the grace during these Advent days to do that. That we may truly know our purpose, we may live it to the full, and that doing so, we may bring forth life. And God may be glorified now and forever. Amen.